is also here with us, so hello to Sharp, that's the same. Uh, this is not the first time that Gutem is uh, supporting us. It's quite a few already. It's quite a few already in the COVID times. So uh, Gutem, it's really an honor to have you here again at the Virtual Seed Congress. Thank you for joining. And uh, as they say today, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Vinko. And I really want to thank all the young professionals in Region 8 uh, uh, because, you know, they, uh, Tushar, Vinko, Sara, and others, they contacted me and I was, uh, I agreed immediately uh, to be part of this uh, because, um, you know, I always like talking to people, young professionals and students in particular, because they are our future. We are, uh, you know, getting old. So we want the next generation of leaders to take over and, you know, spread the uh, words about the technology and uh, the science. So today, uh, what I'm going to talk about, let me share my screen. Uh, so what do I do? I already, my screen is here. Okay. And yes, I it is on. Good, and you can start. Okay, so, uh, okay, so I can go to full screen. Okay. So how do I go to full screen? Let me, let me share again. So that way it will be better. See, we can land someone on moon and send a spacecraft to Mars, but always there is problem when we are trying to, you know, sh uh, share screen or... <laughs> yes, it always happens at my faculty as well. That's right. So all of you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, this question that bothers all of us and that we are trying to find an answer to is, are, you alone, are we alone in this universe? And what NASA and all other space agencies are doing to answer this question. If you look at the screen, the first screen, I put this on purpose, uh, you know, because the curiosity that, you know, drives our, uh, you know, all this research that we do, uh, because always, and for a small kid, particularly as girls, uh, that is very important for us. We, uh, we want to have uh, in future women landing on moon, uh, as well as, you know, to other planets. So this is very important to me and I think for all of us. So that's why this screen itself is very, very important to all of us. It's showing that how curious we are and that's what drives all the technology that we develop. So before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, my group members. Uh, the name of our group, a small group of people that we are working on is some millimeter wave advanced technology. If you look at their faces, you will see that they come from all over the world. And that is very important for this forum as well. One of the reason uh, NASA has been so successful is because of the diversity of people that we have, diversity of talent. People come from all over the world. They are the best and the brightest, and we are really lucky to have these people. I always tell others that if you want to be successful in your professional career, you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. That's what I have been doing in my life. And you know, I'm so I want to acknowledge their you know, contributions and support uh, for this endeavor. So a little bit about NASA and JPL, uh, you know, uh, many of you know that NASA uh, has many centers all over the United States and the headquarters is in Washington, D.C. that is in the East Coast. And I am here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that is on the West Coast. And JPL is one of the largest laboratories for NASA and where we do the robotic missions. All the missions that you see going to Mars, the rover, uh, and the lander uh, that is on its way uh, to Mars right now. Uh, it has been uh, designed and developed at JPL and we do all like science all across the different... Can, uh, sorry yes. to interrupt you. We, uh, we don't, don't see your presentation screen. We see the ones you started. So could you please uh, try okay. to share? Okay, we see this one. Uh, this one you can see now? Okay. Yes, if, with your uh, for some reason if I... Okay, maybe let me do this. Now, can you see my screen, the full screen? No, it's still the same one. Okay, so that means uh, I am, okay, something is happening. 
you are sharing screen so i was doing hmm. mm -hmm. let me try again i'm sorry as i said it's always a challenge uh, okay so now let me try again uh, let's see Maybe I'll do entire screen. No, I don't want to do entire screen. Let, let me try again. Sorry. Mm. I think, uh, yes, if, if you go full screen, it's kind of another application. That's how it works. That's right. It, it, it's showing up right now. You know that. It, OK, let me. I think now I'll be able to do that. Again, something is happening always some issues <laughs> i'm sorry i'm really sorry no no problem we're, we're gonna wait for you <laughs> so yeah so if you actually have uh, vinko if you can put me on the screen or myself then maybe i'll be able to do that again uh just me yeah let me try now uh not happening again share screen uh it's not allowing me to share screen now for some reason mm -hmm. Okay, so let. So I'm clicking uh, on share screen. And tell you what, Gutam. Could you uh, refresh your browser, please? Just click the refresh part, and then you will come back to us. Uh, stay on. <clears throat> Okay, I think okay. I'm back. Welcome back. All right, yes, now let me try to share the screen, allow. Okay, now you can see my screen, right? Yes, not the full screen mode, but the PowerPoint mode. Okay, so Uber here to hide. Okay, so the moment I go away, Okay, so if I it's, again, there is some I don't know how to uh, you know. Okay, so maybe I yeah. If I now if I change my uh, slide, can you see the next slide? On yes, your Just side. We okay. can see it. Yes. Maybe I I I, I play in this mode only. That's yeah. okay. So, if All right. you can zoom it a little bit, and uh, I think it's really fine. It, it's okay now. Yes. All right, let's go with this. I'm sorry again. So uh, what I was saying that we are at JPL and we this is one of the largest NASA labs. We build robots and all these different kinds of instruments for astrophysics, planetary science. Okay, so let's go what we do here. So this is uh, the Big Bang Theory. This is not the Big Bang Theory that you watch on TV. This is the real Big Bang Theory. So we all know that the universe started with a Big Bang and the current age of the universe is about 13.85 billion years. And then if you actually go back, we can go back in time and try to understand what happened at the beginning of the universe. And if you try to do that in terms of uh, you know, electromagnetic waves, uh, then we can go back only about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The reason is that there is no uh, radiation that came out before 380,000 years of Big Bang. And uh, the reason at the time, because it had a very hot plasma, there's a lot of scattering and no light could escape. The first light that came out is called cosmic microwave back background signal. And how it was discovered is very interesting. The two scientists, at uh, engineers and scientists at AT&T Bell Labs, they were doing some communication experiments in the millimeter wave. You know, we know a lot of things we hear nowadays about millimeter waves uh, and 5G and beyond. So, but, you know, even in 1960s, people are uh, doing some experiments in the millimeter wave. And when they are doing their experiment, they were getting some extra noise in the receivers. And wherever they looked, they were finding some extra noise. And they could not figure it out why they were getting extra noise. And if uh, they were like me, you know, what many of us do that when you cannot explain something that we measure, what do we do? We say it must be uh, the experimental error. 
but they were smarter than at least I am. So what they did, they actually started looking into it very carefully and realized that what they were measuring is the first light of the universe. They are Wilson and Penzias, and Bob Wilson and Penzias, they went out to win Nobel Prize for their discovery. So next time, you when you are doing some experiment in your lab, and if you cannot explain something that you see, uh, do not just put a, increase the error bar of your measurement. You know, just go and look into it, what's going on. Maybe you'll win the Nobel Prize as well. So uh, one of the question that we are trying to answer, as I said at the beginning, that are we alone in this universe? So many people ask me. So let's first set the stage very, very, you know, you know, clear and say that we have not found any life anywhere outside our planet Earth. Whatever you read about aliens, whatever we read about anything else, we have not found. There is no evidence of life anywhere else. So, but when the question is asked to me that is there possibility of life outside planet Earth, I say yes. Why do I say that? Let's do some thought experiments. If you look in the sky, you see all those stars, billions and billions of stars. You know, in our own galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, we have about 100 billion stars. And again, we have about 100 billion galaxies in this universe which means that about 10 to the power 22, 10 to the power 23 stars in this universe. And we are finding that increasingly, most of the stars, they have planets and they're called exoplanets and not just one planet, more than one planet. So what is now the possibility is that we find one such planet in those billions and trillions of stars that the conditions are such that life can exist. So the prob probability is finite. And that's what we are actually trying to do. We are trying to find out those planets where uh, it's favorable to have a life. We call them, they're in the habitable zone, the, all, the, all the Goldilocks zone. What it means is that if the planet is such from the star, the parent star, is that the temperature is, is nice enough that the liquid water, liquid water can exist on the surface, we call them they're in the habitable zone. Because when you are looking for life, we are looking for the life, for life that we know about. That is the carbon-based life that needs water, that needs oxygen. And we, are, we actually found quite a few of these uh, planets which are in the habitable zone. So that's what our search is on. But again, we have not found any life anywhere yet. And you all know that we, NASA, as well as many other uh, nations, they keep going back to Mars. So why do we go back to Mars? Why do we spend money to, what is so interesting about Mars? The reason is if you look at Mars, in its early, universe, you know, early history, Mars resembles quite a lot like our planet Earth. And we, uh, but things have changed over time. So we actually are trying to understand, is Mars habitable today? Was Mars habitable at any point of time? Is, does, uh, did it harbor life at any point of time? So these, that, these answers will give us a lot of confidence in trying to you know, explore beyond Mars and other places. So if I tell you that this, uh, this picture is from some place on Earth, you'll say, oh yeah, it, it, looks, it looks very familiar, uh, but it is from Mars. If you look at the terrain very carefully, what you will realize that we get this kind of terrain only when there is flowing water. So we, when you go to Mars today, we do not see much water. There is water a little bit under the ground, but we do not see much water. But at one point of time on Mars, there was a lot of water. The question is what happened? Where did that water go? Can it happen to our own planet? So these are the questions that we are trying to understand. So I will actually show you some of the science questions and then talk about technology that we are developing. So again, you see here the different, uh, you know, that uh, rovers that we have developed over the years. Pathfinder was 1996, then we had the Twin uh, Spirit and Opportunity, 2003, it landed on Mars. 
2011, we had uh, Curiosity, and right now, Perseverance rover is on its way to Mars, and it will arrive there in February 2021. You can see that the size of this and the complexities of these rovers has increased over time. It is extremely challenging to land on Mars. The, uh, it's, I give an analogy. Uh, suppose um, uh, you are playing basketball, and let's say you are in Europe somewhere, and you are playing basketball, but you are holding the ball there in Europe, but the basket is not in next to you. It is here in Pasadena, and you'll have to throw that basketball and in a way that it goes through the basket here in Pasadena without touching the rim. And that is the kind of challenge we have to land on the surface of Mars with an accuracy about you know, 40 kilometer diameter. So it is not at all easy, and that's why not many countries have been successful. Uh, so we will see, let's hope that we are successful this time as well. So March 2020, the Perseverance rover has, this is a kind of a depiction of that rover. Uh, there are a lot of different instruments it will do. It will try to, uh, the main goal of this mission is to find out is Mars habitable today or worse, was Mars habitable at any point of time? Is there, is there life or was there life on Mars at any point of time? So that is the main goal of this mission. And also it has a helicopter. I talked a little bit about it uh, uh, toward the end. So this is the uh, actual photograph of Mars uh, Perseverance rover just before it was shipped uh, for launching. This is in our lab. Uh, all already. So you can see here this really a big instrument, very complex instrument. This is one of the most expensive auto driving, self driving car that you can build. Uh, it costs a lot of money, but it, it will do a lot of good science. And that's why we are really excited about. So this is a picture that I'm showing that was sent by Mars rover Curiosity uh, in 2014. And what you see here is a dot on, on that is our planet Earth, and if you expand, you can see the Earth and the Moon. Why I'm showing this? Because uh, this is for the first time our planet Earth was pictured from the surface of another planet. This really, really a cool stuff. And you know, as a student, as a young professional, as also as you know, uh, old professionals like me, we uh, we look at uh, this uh, this kind of. Uh, pictures and sometimes we think you know we know everything we we, we are so smart um, however if you if if that kind of actually sense comes over to you you should think about this picture because what it shows that in the big scheme of thing we are just a dot in the sky so hopefully that once you think about that it will ground you and you know that for electrical engineers grounding is very important so that's why I show this picture to uh, uh, people. Okay, let's talk about you know exoplanets and other planets that we are finding. We have found so far about 4,000 plus exoplanets, that is planets around other stars. And they are distributed all over in the, in the size and the nature of them. You, know, you can see we are finding star uh, planets which are like our planet Earth. And also we are finding gas giants. Majority of the planets we are finding that gas giants like Jupiter that cannot you know, uh, sustain life. We are looking for you know, rocky planets like our planet Earth. And then uh, in the thing is and we are also finding, as I said, many of them are in the habitable zone and we are trying to look for it. Question is, how do we actually find this kind of planet? What is the techniques? that you use to find planets around other stars. One of the, uh, so you might, uh, before I do that, you can see that I mentioned that we have trillions and trillions of stars and trillions and trillions of planets. Then why did we find only 4,000 planets? The reason is this is, we looked at in a very narrow region of our own galaxy so far. We have not uh, looked around in many places. The reason is that we do not have that technology to actually look at a far off galaxies and far off stars to find out if there is any planet. We need uh, new technologies, we need better technologies. And that's why I'm looking at you all and I, hopefully you all will you know, contribute to uh, developing the technology that we can use in the future to detect these planets at far off places. 
So how do we actually uh, uh, detect uh, planets around another star? How do you do that is, so if you have actually, this is, this has some animation, but since I'm not in full screen mode, you won't be able to see perhaps. So uh, what it is that how we do, suppose we want to look at a star and find out if there is any planet. So we somehow isolate the total amount of light that is coming from that star. And then if you, if you look at this, the brightness, we measure the total light that is coming. And if there is a planet and as the planet goes in front of that star, the total amount of light reduces ever slightly. And if our detector is sensitive enough, it will be able to detect that. And then we say, huh, there is a planet. And by measuring you know, how much time it takes and also doing some gravitational calculations, you'll be able to tell a lot about the kind of planet that one is. You can measure the density and you can say, oh, it's a rocky planet. Okay, what is the period of that planet? And by that, you'll be able to say, okay, what is the surface temperature of that planet? And by that, we'll be able to say, oh, the, which means that if there is liquid water, then it can actually, it can survive on the surface of that planet. The temperature is good enough. So that's how we actually detect uh, this kind of, uh, you know, planets. And then another way, uh, again, there is an animation. Uh, maybe I can play it. So hopefully you, you are able to see that. So what it is that, and this is another technique is called radial Doppler method. So if we look at the light that is coming from the star, and then as the planet goes in front and away from that star, because of the Doppler effect, the frequency shifts ever slightly. By measuring the change of frequency, you'll be able to tell that there is a planet that is going around that star. So there are a lot of different techniques that we use, but again, you need extremely sensitive detectors. You need extremely sensitive instrument. That's what we build in our lab. So, okay, I'll stop it and then, okay. So one more thing is about searching, as I mentioned that we are looking for life and the kind of life that we know that is hydrocarbon based life. It needs water. Is there water out there in the outer space? Um, answer is yes. We are finding that from, you know, sun like star, very young stars, water molecules are moving like bullets in 200,000 kilometers per hour. These water molecules are traveling that fast. If you fire a bullet from an AK-47 rifle, it actually goes at 2,500 kilometers per hour, which means these water molecules are traveling 80 times faster. And then if something, you know, travel that fast, it generates a lot of heat. It tries to destroy itself, but the conditions are such that it finds a way to recombine and generate huge amount of water. How much? 100 million times the total amount of water in the Amazon river is created per second in one of these stars, which means that we are actually flooded. This universe is flooded with water. So if there is water, is their life? So that is the question we are trying to answer. And talking about water, there is another very intriguing, uh, interesting um, uh, information we have is that when the earth was formed, there was no water. And we scientists believe that the comets brought water to earth. If I tell you that you are going to say, you know, I don't believe you, how do you prove that? So one of the way to prove is that there are actually different kinds of water. The water that we drink every day, is H216O. That means the you know, oxygen has different isotopes. The 16th isotope of oxygen, that is the most stable uh, isotope, that is the most abundant water in the universe. And that's what we drink every day. But there are other kinds of water, H217O, H218O, uh, and HDO, one hydrogen, one deuterium, and oxygen also forms water. And then if you actually take the ratio of the abundances of different kinds of water, we find that the, the ratio that we have on planet Earth is very similar to some of the comets, that are called Jupiter family comets. So if the ratios are same, then the source has to be the same. But we have not really answered this question completely yet. So currently I'm, I'm building an instrument to go to a comet, a very small CubeSat instrument that will go to a 
a comet and do this measurement. If you can show that it works well, then with CubeSat technology, we'll be able to go to multiple comets and answer this question once for all. So that's what we are trying to do here. So another thing is that life on Enceladus. Enceladus is a moon. So what we are talking about in the beginning is life on other planets, exoplanets. But is there possibility of life in our own solar system? Answer is yes, we have to look for it. One of them is Enceladus. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. What you see here using uh, a instrument called HiFi on Herschel, it was from ESA uh, launched this uh, observation, observatory, Herschel Space Observatory, but we had instrument, HiFi instrument built at NASA. And using that instrument, we found that water is gushing out of Enceladus. Enceladus is a very, uh, very cold planetary body. And if there is water coming out, then there has to be a source of energy inside. That's what is making the water uh, in, the, in the liquid form. Then if there is source of energy, if there is water, what else is coming out from? What else is there in that water? Is there organic materials? Is there any uh, you know, uh, life in, in that water? So we are actually planning in future to have a mission to go to Enceladus and look, uh, you know, uh, do experiments there directly to answer that question. That will be very exciting. The Another place where life can exist in our solar system is Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. It's a very cold planetary body. There is thick ice on the surface, but scientists believe that there is a liquid water ocean underneath that Europa. This is, you can see here, which means that there is a mantle which produces heat that is keeping this water in the liquid form. And we believe that the thickness of the ice shell on the top is about 15 kilometers to 100 kilometers. So if uh, we ask, we come to you and ask question that, okay, NASA is planning a mission to go to Europa and we want to find out, is there life in the water ocean of Europa? What kind of instrument you are going to send there? Just to set the stage, uh, it takes about seven years to go to Europa. The obvious answer is we should send a drill. We should drill a hole and trying to find out, take a uh, a bucket, get a bucket full of water and see what is there. Is there any fish? The problem is that when, as I said, it takes seven years to go to Europa and we have total amount of DC power available for this mission is about 300 to 400 watts, three to four light bulbs. How can you drill a hole of 15 to 100 kilometers, uh, you know, through ice with that amount of power? It's not going to happen. But there are other ways, actually. You can think out of the box. What it, we found that there are a lot of cracks in this ice and this material seeps all the way to the top. But since it's very cold, it freezes. However, Europa is very close to Jupiter. And you all know that Jupiter is very high magnetic field. That means very high radiation environment. What it does, it actually sputters the material in the atmosphere. And we are in the process of building a lot of different instruments uh, to see what is there in that, what is coming out in the atmosphere. Is there any organic materials? Is, is there any life forming materials? So we are actually trying to do that. And I, I will also want to mention the most recent news that you read uh, that Venus, there's a possibility of life in Venus. So that is very exciting because if you think about Venus, Venus, the surface temperature of Venus is about 400 degrees centigrade. So nothing, no life can exist, you know, survive there. However, if you, as you go in the upper atmosphere of Venus, uh, you find that the temperature is about 20 degrees uh, centigrade uh, at, at 55 kilometer and above, which means that is very conducive to life. And recent finding using two instruments, JCMT, James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii, and the uh, ALMA, uh, Atacama Large Millimeter Array, that is in Chile, this two, using these two instruments, working in the 267 gigahertz, uh, that is a, in the millimeter wave uh, uh, frequency, they detected phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus and found it that in the large quantities, in the about 20 parts per billion, on planet Earth, phosphine is produced by abiotic process, but amount is very, very low. But 
if you have to generate more amount of phosphine, uh, then you most the, the current chemistry tells us that it has to be through a biotic process. That means that organic process. Uh, then question is from where this phosphine coming from? You know, Venus is not a hydrogen enriched environment. So you cannot really produce this amount of phosphine without uh, a, a biotic process. That's why it's very interesting to find out is uh, you know to follow up mission to find out is there really life uh, that phosphine that we are seeing is you know life related or not. So that is very exciting, and we actually have been building instrument to go to Venus to do exactly that because we are building instruments in the 267 gigahertz as well as 500 gigahertz band to do make those measurements. So let's talk, those are the science questions. Now let's talk a little bit about the technologies that we need to act, uh, uh, develop to answer this kind of questions. To go do planetary uh, bodies, we need to make everything small. Miniaturization is the key. And you know that, you know, uh, we are very good at making things small. The first IC that was built in 1960 had three to four transistors. And then in 1969, we had about 2000 transistors for Intel chip uh, 1101. And we nowadays, we are building chips which has billions of transistors and most of these transistors work. The question is just making a chip is not enough. Many of you are working on building chips but just making a chip is not enough. You'll have to build a system out of that. SOCs are very important. And you can see here that it, you can look at the size of the Federal's one megawatt pulse and arc radio transmitter that was in 1917. It was such a huge thing. And if you see on the top right of your screen, you know what that is? That is your iPhone 5S. That is the entire circuit of iPhone 5S. Have you opened, uh, ever opened your smartphone? If not, you should. I opened my wife's smartphone, iPhone. Uh, that was uh, because of there was water damage. But what, if you open it, what you'll find that, you know, technology, how, uh, you know, these things have been assembled, what level of integration that has been done with different chips, what kind of connectors that we have used. So we are actually using the same kind of technology, same kind of assembly, and architecture so that we can make the instruments very agile, very low power and low mass. And that is the key for future space exploration. You'll have to make everything very highly integrated. So we are actually being successful in doing that. And also we are building CubeSats. CubeSats are shoebox size satellites that will go to outer space. It costs so much less when you are building a a uh, small CubeSat compared to a large spacecraft. However, of course, you'll have to do some compromise. You cannot really do what you do with a, a you know, large spacecraft. And there are many CubeSat, uh, you know, instruments are in, uh, in being planned right now all over the world. And many of you know that the first CubeSat that we sent to an outer planet was Marco, Mars Cube 1. Why we sent that was that for the inside uh, spacecraft, it was going to Mars. When the spacecraft lands on Mars, for about seven to eight minutes, we do not have any direct communication with the uh, uh, to the Earth, and so we don't know what whether the uh, spacecraft landed or what is the health of the spacecraft. To avoid that, what we did is that when the uh, uh, the spacecraft was inserted in the Martian atmosphere, we also released two. Cube, you know, CubeSats. These CubeSats are uh, 6U, that is 30 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter, very small. And then they, they had two uh, communication links. One was UHF that was talking to the spacecraft and we had a X-band transmitter directly to Earth. So it was transmitting all the health data back to Earth, you know, kind of live. But it, again, it takes seven minutes for signal to reach to Earth from Mars, but it was very, very successful. So CubeSats are really getting a lot of attention from a lot of different space agencies and the students can work on them. You know, young professionals can work on them and you can actually build space, this CubeSat and get access to launch. So we can actually do a lot of stuff with this CubeSat. And another thing that we used 
is called you know uh, a rain cube this is uh, i can show you hopefully it will show yes you can see here uh, that it is again a 60 cube sat very small but it has a very large antenna you know 50 centimeter antenna so that's where you have to innovate you have to come up with new ideas that how can we fit a large antenna in a very small volume this is a deployable antenna at k band uh, so we have been uh, successful in doing it. So this is my uh, colleague uh, uh, Nasser Chahat and others. Uh, they uh, developed this antenna and it's really cool because it works very well. And we are trying to build even larger antenna. This is 50 centimeter in diameter. We are trying to build even larger one of them, but it's very challenging. And also we are trying to do it higher frequencies. And how, how does it work? You can see here that in the lab, I'll show you that once we this, uh, release a spring, then it opens up. I show you, hopefully you are able to see the video. It's not full screen, unfortunately, because it deploys and then the sub reflector needs to deploy as well. And there is a horn, K band, horn antenna. This is a K band, horn antenna here. And it worked really well. So. Uh, we are able to actually come up with new ideas for these kind of CubeSat instruments. That is the key. And we are trying to build even larger. We are also developing other kind of antennas. We call it, you know, meta surface antennas. We call future is flat. These are all metal structure antennas that can go very low profile. The, the, uh, this is at KA band. The thickness of the antenna, the metal antenna, is uh, of the order of 1.5 millimeter. So really, really low profile. It can go on the side wall of the CubeSat. So it becomes an antenna and they're working really well. So we are looking into this kind of antenna technology for future. And again, you can see how it will uh, you know, go in the side wall of a CubeSat. And we, are, we have built one of these antenna uh, using 3D metal printing technology at K band, but we also made a 300 gigahertz using you know, metal silicon micro machining, metal pins. So these are uh, all new technologies that we are coming up with to answer these kind of questions. So I was mentioning about that CubeSat instrument that I'm developing to go to a comet to measure water. So I named it Water Hunting Advanced Terahertz Spectrometer on Ultra Small Platform, What's Up? Because we are trying to uh, answer this question, what's up with water, from where the water has come from. This is a, I thought is a cool acronym. Uh, and we are actually building this, is almost ready, this instrument. So we have a lot of innovative ideas in this uh, instrument. This is a block diagram, this is 500 to 600 gigahertz because the water molecules I talked to about the HDO, H250, H16, H217, H218O, all of them are in this frequency band, 509 gigahertz to about 557 gigahertz. So we are building a very low power and low mass. So the total mass of the instrument, entire instrument, the high resolution spectrometer has to be less than two kilograms and the total power it needs five watts or less. Five watts is your, you know, your, your night bulb is five, five watts. So that's the amount of power it will draw to uh, make an entire uh, instrument. So this is uh, the kind of new antenna technology that we are using. We're using some MEMS switch as well to do calibration. And uh, you know that we have done all these measurements. We have done SOC based you know, uh, system on a chip. This is a uh, 65 nanometer uh, CMOS technology to develop W band synthesizer and back end spectrometer. Uh, so Adrian Tang, my colleague, he has been working on them. So we have, you need a village, you need, you know, expertise in all different areas to come together and then make an instrument that will be very small in size and draws less amount of power. So this is how, when I assemble this instrument, this looks like, this is a US penny that you can see. This is the previous version, previous generation of this instrument is to be like a huge, uh, you know, a huge box, like a size of a big table. And now we are able to make the same kind of performance that this instrument can provide, but in a much smaller package like this, you can see here. 
And I will, this my last two slides, I'll talk about the Mars helicopter that we all hear. This is called Ingenuity helicopter. And we uh, decided to use a helicopter on Mars. The question is why? The reason is when the rover lands on Mars, it we actually upload all the programs. This is self-driving car, but we want them to go certain places, do some experiments. And so it, it can go on yet limited uh, amount of spaces. So we thought that if we can send a helicopter, which will have some reconnaissance and detectors on them, then it can go and it can take off from the rover, go around, take some pictures, take some data and send it back to the rover. And then the rover can go to those places. The question is, what is the big deal about sending a helicopter to Mars? The big deal is that uh, you know, Mars atmosphere is much lighter than planet Earth. So when you have a helicopter on Earth, the, the rotor blade that rotates about 400 to 600 RPM. However, to have the same kind of lift on Mars, the helicopter blade has to go around 2,600 to 3,000 RPM. It's a huge, huge challenge. But we were able to successful and demonstrated in our lab, we created a Martian environment in our lab and we this helicopter worked well. It draws about 220 watts and it weighs about 1.4 kilograms. So this is the picture of the Ingenuity helicopter just before it was integrated on the Perseverance rover. And you can see that. So, and with that, uh, I will end. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of exciting thing going on. And the key is that we still have not found life outside uh, our planet Earth, but the search is on. And hopefully one day we'll, we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Gautam. It was a wonderful presentation indeed. And uh, we are now part of this uh, question and answers uh, sessions and uh, you have received some very colorful questions, <laughs> but I'm going to bring it closer to you. Uh, perhaps starting with the first one, uh, why is the finding of life so important to us? That's because I, as a human being, we, you know, why do we do science? We want to understand uh, how things work, right? The basic uh, thing, nature of science is trying to find how things work. And in that process, we want to find out that if, uh, you know, that how life came about on planet Earth. And one of the most exciting thing for human being is to find out that can there be life somewhere else? Is there any other place where life can exist? And, you know, and what is the process that it, it, it comes about? So this is a basic fundamental human, you know, nature of finding uh, are we alone? So that's why it's very, very important to figure it out because then we'll understand how life came about here as well. And on top of that, what we need to do to you know, protect it. As you know, you know, a lot of things are going on all around the world, you can the climate change and everything. So it's very, very important for us to focus on those uh, questions and find a way to preserve. Because as I said, you know, people, ask, people say that they want to go to Mars you want to live there, you want to form a colony. My question, my question always is, why do you want to do that? The best place to live in this universe, at least what we know, is still planet Earth. Then, you know, we have to make sure that we protect it. We find a way to preserve it. So we are trying to understand what we need to do. And in that also, you know, we want to find out about, you know, how life happened, because that is the most and the fundamental question with the, uh, this life is very different. We cannot, our technologies cannot still create life, life-like thing. So what is it that, you know, allows this kind of things to happen? How this come about? So that is very intriguing. Thank you very much, Gautam. I think uh, it answers the questions pretty well for everyone. It is the main drive for this presentation at the end. Uh, so we have a second one, uh, uh, how, well, a little bit of conspiracy theories. 
of the uh, unidentified flying objects. Uh, but uh, let me rephrase it a little bit. Uh, how much do we expect that the life in the universe is advanced compared to the basic? Are we looking for the electromagnetic uh, signature or more of the chemical compounds? And uh, what is your... That's a very good question. It's about, you know, that I, I knew that any talk I give, two questions people ask about the aliens, UFOs, and Area 51. These are, you know, I know, I'm sure that someone will be asking me about Area 51 as well. So to answer your question, we don't know what kind of life we can find. You know, it, is it a single cell life? Is it an advanced life? So we are looking into all different areas. As you know, there is a program called SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. What it does is that we transmit uh, some signals. You know, if you know, for, if you look at the kind of signal that we can transmit, that is, let's say, Morse code kind of signal, that has a pattern. If we receive something like that from outer space, then we'll be able to tell. You know, it is a, a man-made or you know, life-made. We cannot say man really. What kind of life we don't know. We, uh, so whether it's the intelligent, uh, you know, life made that signal or it coming from nature. So these are the two uh, uh, different kinds. So it, to, uh, to be honest, we don't know what we are going to find. But if you uh, actually think about that, the possibilities, then uh, it, I, I, I won't be surprised if there is, you know, advanced life somewhere. But it is so far away. I'll give an example. We are finding some exoplanets in the habitable zone. They're four light years away. If you say four light years, how, how much time it is going to take? It will take millions of years for us to reach there if with current day technology, which means that we cannot really reach there anytime soon, uh, with uh, unless and until we do, uh, come up with new technologies. So whatever we have to learn, uh, we have to learn from here about those places. So it is really intriguing. I don't know what you are going to find. So it is difficult to say uh, whether li that life will be really advanced or primitive. But my bet will be, I won't be surprised if we find advanced life. We have a next one very well aligned with this one. Is uh, How much do we expect that life is similar to our life on Earth? If we find uh, so again, we don't know. It, it, it need not be similar. And a lot of people ask me also this question that, why are we looking for life of our kind, that hydrocarbon life? Why can't we search? For other kind of life, the uh, answer to that question is: How do you search for something you have you have no idea about? We always search for something that, based on our knowledge, right? So that I know what to look for. In this case, we know what kind of life that we have here, hydrocarbon life. So, what are the signatures for that? We can look for those. But it is possible that we'll stumble upon. Uh, you know, other form of life, but we cannot actively search for that. So we are actively searching for our kind of life and hope maybe we'll, you know, stumble upon other kind of life. Yes, very good. And, uh, as I see, we are looking very far in the universe, but we are also finding a lot in our solar system. Uh, and it seems that every time we send a mission uh, to some planet, we really find something really interesting in the means of a new compound or whatever in the completely unexpected way. So uh, do you feel that uh, our solar system still has a lot of secrets that we need to discover? Yet? Uh, answer is absolutely yes, because we know so less uh, about our own solar system. The reason is that we have not gone to many of these places, even for Mars that you think that uh, People might think that we keep going back. You know, number of places we have gone is very few. Suppose some aliens, you know, again, there is no aliens, okay? So if suppose some aliens land at a place like Sahar Desert, uh, and then it's, it looks around in that nearby area, uh, what will, it, will they find? They won't find anything, right? So same way, so if we land some places on Mars that we might not find something, that does not necessarily mean that there is not other ex interesting things are available. So we, again, you know, NASA has a limited amount of budget and we want to do so many things. We want to find out, you know, exoplanets. We want to find out, uh, you know, uh, how the galaxies are formed, how we all came about, 
how other how the exoplanets are working how jupiter works you know how what is happening in enceladus but we can do only a few things because of the limited amount of budget we have so that's why all we know the, uh, time has come for all of us all the countries all the space agencies to work together to you know make an impact because if we uh, these are too complex too expensive too big missions so only way we can do that is uh, uh, when we all join hands. And you know, science has always, science never uh, follows any boundaries. We always are, you know, tied together through science. So in this uh, time when there is so much of divisiveness and so much of, you know, uh, animosity and anxiety, so only thing is very important that we look into science even for COVID, you know, we have to look into science and that actually binds us all together. So this is a very important message I want to convey that we'll have to all join hands and then, you know, explore the space together. Very great. And uh, yeah, uh, we have another question. It's uh, perhaps steering more to the private sector. And we have witnessed uh, recent uh, successes in this part. And uh, what is this contribution to the space exploration? And uh, how, in, well, in, the question is exactly, uh, what about a space tourism? Will it become reality? And uh, will it in some way contribute to some to space exploration? So it's really great that private companies are actually stepping up and taking interest in space. And of course, you know, NASA and all other space agencies are helping them, you know, SpaceX uh, did, uh, you know, uh, send it to ISS and brought people back. That is really, really exciting because for the first time, a private company was able to, you know, send a spacecraft that with human being that docked in the International Space Station and brought them back. So this is great. You know, why people all sometimes ask me that does NASA see that as a competition? It is not a competition because NASA is helping them. We want uh, you know, private companies to be successful, then we can actually load off a lot of this stuff on, uh, let the uh, companies do that, then we can focus more on the science aspect of it. Because at the end of the day, we are in the business of science. We develop technologies to answer science questions. So again, the uh, this private company like SpaceX and Blue Origin and everyone else, they have their private business also in mind so that they can, uh, take human beings, you know, kind of space tourism. And that's not bad at all. You know, who doesn't want to go to space? If it is affordable, uh, then of course, everyone wants to go. I want to go to space if I can afford, but I cannot. Uh, so, uh, so that is very exciting that all these different companies are coming in because when private companies join, you know, join in, always technology, we get improved technology, we get faster development. So it is very, very important that we work together with them and help them to achieve their goal uh, so that it will help all of us at the end of the day. Yes, indeed. And I think this past few months really witnessed how the government and private sector can really match their goals into finding a single, single goal in the COVID situation, definitely. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are switching off uh, a little bit more to the technological part. Uh, sure. and the question is, at this moment, what kind of technology that is missing now limits scientific discovery most? Is it propulsion, communication, RF, optochemical tech, or is it something else? So answer is all of them. Uh, the reason is this, as I said, we have to look into propulsion uh, because we are finding uh, all these uh, you know, exoplanets that are so far off, if we do not invest and also if we do not innovate in the propulsion area, we won't be able to actually uh, go to those places. So what a lot of different propulsion technologies are being looked at. One of them is electric propulsion. And also we'll have to go faster. We'll have to go, you know, in a green and green way. You know, that is that, you know, we have to protect our environment as well. We we'll have to protect the environment where we are going. We should not go and, and destroy another planet's environment the way we are in destroying our own. So we'll have to be very cognizant of that fact as well. And also there is advantage in the sense that it takes less amount of, you know, one of the things that we can send someone today to Mars, but we cannot bring them back because we do not have, this is a one-way ticket. So we do not have the technology that we can, 
say in a safe way we can send someone and bring them back so that's why we really need to invest in that those areas about propulsion and in terms of other you know the mechanical uh, material science uh, electronics because we need to have you know data rate data rate is a big big problem because when we have a small antenna on a spacecraft we have all the data that we gather we collect we'll have to you know downstream it how do you send it back at a very high data rate currently we send it in kilobytes you know uh, from you know from mars it is and voyager it has gone outside our solar system it is sending bits uh, you know so it, it cannot really send any picture it can just tell that oh i'm still alive so that kind of situation so we'll have to invest and come up innovate in the communication side in the electronic side how can we make very low power and you know low mass uh, instruments so and how can you make more sensitive detectors so in all different aspects so people who are listening in who are students and who are young professionals don't think that we have solved all the problems we have not solved anything we have so much more to do and you can contribute so please come and join us uh, so that we can make progress. Thank you, Guta. It really answers the question I was meaning to ask. Uh, what is, uh, how can students currently contribute to it? Not at this moment, but what to study and where to end up in a few years? How to reach this uh, part where you're sitting now after a while and uh, all the things that come to this career space. And do you have a, advice for them yes you know that's with students and postdocs they play a such an important role for any space agency's work because right now in our lab we have a lot of postdocs uh, they they come over nasa has a very good postdoctoral program called npp if you are interested you should go do a google search called npp nasa postdoctoral program and we actually this open for everyone from all across the globe and we do get a lot of people from Europe, Asia, and other countries, uh, postdocs. And most often they are the best. And if, when they come here, they work with us. And we already know how good they are. So that, you know, at the end, if we have any openings, we actually hire them. Instead of looking outside, we already know them. So this is one way to get, uh, you know, hired in a, a place like NASA to come through the postdoctoral program. Even for students, NASA, if you go to nasa.gov website, that is also true for all other space agencies. ESA, if you go to ESA, if you go to ISRO, if you go to JAXA, uh, and all other space agencies, they have student internship programs. And NASA has a big internship programs. And only issue is that we can take, because of the rules that is the government of U United States has, we can take 100 international students as interns per year for all NASA's centers. But still, we can take uh, international students for the, as interns, but generally the internship happens, uh, it, uh, the, op the portal opens up in January, so it is for in the summer months. So you can go there and find out and you know, contact people. But again, we as, as, a, as someone, I won't be able to actually take you directly as an intern because it has to go through this process. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people on LinkedIn and other spaces, they ask me, can you take me as intern? So I'll have to say I cannot because there is a process in place and we want to make it fair for everyone so that everyone has a chance. Uh, so that's why you should go there, go to the NASA website and apply. Again, the portal opens up in January. So at that time, you will be able to apply and then you know, come over and see what we do. We like students to come uh, and work with us because we learn as much more uh, from them that they learn from us. Uh, you know, the reason is that I always say that experience is a good thing, but experience also corrupts us because sometimes experience tells us that, oh, you cannot do this. But the students and the young professionals, they don't have that fear. They are not corrupted by experience. So they say, no, you can do this. And, so, and they are right sometimes, you know. So that's why we need young professionals and students and postdocs to come and work with us to, you know, to kind of jolt us and say, no, 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 think big. Well, 
Thanks a lot, Gautam, for this lovely presentation, for the great and inspiring words. You have a lot of thanks from uh, coming from all over the world on the, in the chat, in the questions. Uh, people were really enjoying it. Did you really feel inspired and motivated? And I think today is, this is a little bit more important than it was yesterday. And uh, I think we will all carry it for tomorrow as well. So thanks once again, Gautam. It was an honor to host you in the Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed, as I said, I really enjoyed talking to you all. I will actually want to say one few, you know, one last word before I go that, you know, we all talk about technology, we talk about science, but at the end of the day, what is most important as we are all human beings, the human qualities are very, very important. You can be the most successful scientists, engineers in the world, but it's more important to be a good human being. So have empathy uh, and, you know, do something for your fellow, you know, colleagues and friends. And, uh, and uh, so never forget that. So this is very, very important. We should not lose sight of that. So be a good human being as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gautam. And with these words, we are ending the session. Thank Goodbye, you. Goodbye, everyone.